Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to week four of our webinar series, Remote Sensing and Forest Cover and Change Assessment for Carbon Monitoring. My name is Amber McCollum, and I will be your instructor today, along with our guest speaker, Pontus Olsen from Boston University. For this course, we have two sessions per week, each Thursday. Um, session A will be from 1 to 2.30 p.m. Eastern, and session B is from 10 we have, we're going to have lectures, guest speakers, and um, Q&A at the end of each of these sessions. Um, you can find all the materials on the Carbon website listed there. Uh, we eventually will also have all the um, PDF versions of the presentations available in Spanish um, in a few weeks. As a reminder, we have two homework assignments. The first homework assignment is online and it's due today. Um, so anytime today, if you complete the homework via the Google form, um, your homework will be counted. The second homework is now also available on the course website. And I've also posted it in the chat box here. And, and I can post it again um, if anyone needs that information. To receive credit for the homework, you must submit all the answers via Google Forms. Um, you will receive an email receipt of homework submission after the deadline. Um, so I've gotten some questions about the homework. Um, I will be going through and marking everyone's um, submission of their homework, and I will be sending you an email with the answer key to the homework sometime next week. So keep an eye out for that. To receive the certificate of completion, you must attend four out of five live webinars and then complete both of the homework assignments by their due date. Um, also, uh, the homework two it, deadline is July 14th. I wanted to mention that as well. And we'll mention that again next week. Here's an overview of the course agenda. This week we will be discussing um, accuracy assessment. So for this week, we will discuss statistical inference and how it's defined according to the IPCC. We will review some terminology such as reference observation, reference data, and accuracy. We will discuss and provide an example of error matrix sample counts and errors of omission and commission. We will discuss error estimators such as bias adjusted and stratified or post stratified estimators. We will provide some information about the BIOTA tool that was developed um, at Boston University and um, if there's time, we'll have some, some questions and answers at the end, and you can type in your questions into the chat, and we will try to get to them. Great. So at this time, I will now hand it over to our guest speaker, Pontus Olsen from Boston University. All right. Thanks, Amber. So yeah, thank you very much for that, Amber. <clears throat> um, as Amber said, I'm, my name is Pontus Olofsson. I'm from Boston University. And I will be talking about stratified estimation today of ac area and accuracy. And I know that the title of this talk is Accuracy Assessment. And it's a little bit more to it than just accuracy. We're doing this within the um, kind of IPCC Red Plus greenhouse gas reporting framework and context and and typically what we're interested in is not necessarily or not primarily at least the accuracy of a map that shows areas of um, activity data typically what we want is an unbiased estimate of the area of deforestation for example and there's a couple of different ways of doing that. I will talk about one of those approaches here, stratified estimation, but I will briefly touch upon some of the other approaches too. Um, the other thing I would like to mention before we start is that Amber just mentioned the BIOTA tools. Um, and I won't talk too much about that for the sake of time. Um, but I will say that that is a soft, an open source software initiative that me and a few others here at BU have, have uh, initiated. 
And it's really a collection of existing open source software. So it's not that we have written a whole bunch of programs and scripts and interfaces and stuff. We're trying to make use um, of existing software that that um, that we use in our own research and that we find helpful. And then we try to fill in the holes such that you can do this kind of work that I was talking about today. We're trying to provide support for much more than just this statistics stuff. We have a time series module in there. There is an object-based image analysis module and a lot of different things. So the idea here is to try to provide open source solutions such that practitioners like yourself can keep up with kind of the latest development in this field, such as, such as time series analysis, <clears throat> statistical inference, and, and object-based image analysis and stuff like that. Um, and, and I'll be happy to answer more questions about that later on, but I won't talk too much about it. Um, I will say that everything that I'll be talking about today you can very easily do in, in the, the Biota virtual machine. Um, and as I said before, it's completely free of, it's completely open source, all the source code is open, doesn't cost anything. Um, so please let me know if you have questions about that. All right, so let's get started with, with um, this lecture on, on statistical inference or, or estimation of area and accuracy. So the way I see this, in order for red plus to happen, in order for us to report, or in order for countries to report um, carbon emissions and removals, I think these three disciplines here need to come together. Right? We have uh, geography, forestry, and statistical inference, or just statistics. And I think traditionally, forestry and statistics, there's been a very clear link. There is, in the National Forest Services around the world, there's a lot of very skilled statisticians working. And at the end of the day, forestry, you know, a big part of, of, of forestry in this context is the National Forest Inventory, which is a sample of, of, a, of a country. And, and there's a lot of statisticians that know how to make very good use of that sample to make inference, to obtain information about the forest of, of, of that country. Um, I think a link that traditionally has been very weak is this link here between geography and statistics. Right. Typically, the geography community is making maps. They're very, very focused on making a map. Um, once the map is done, you might try to provide some accuracy measures of how, of how accurate the map is, but then that's kind of it. But really what, you've, really what you have shown by, by, by showing that the, the accuracy is not 100% is that your map has errors. Right? And if the map has errors, you can't just simply count the pixels in the map. You're going to have to resort to something more elaborate. You're going to have to construct these unbiased estimators that will really give you an estimate of, for example, the area of deforestation or forest gain that is adjusted for classification errors. Right? And this is something that I personally uh, am interested in. I, my, my PhD is in geography, but my educational background is in mathematical statistics. Um, so I am very interested in kind of making this link here. And I think one of my, one of my aims with the papers that I've written and also with these kinds of talks is to debunk some of the myths related to at least the statistics theory that it's really not that difficult and you don't need uh, a degree in statistics or anything like that. I, I usually make the case that, or I usually make the analogy that you don't need to be able to, to take apart the combustion engine in order to drive a car. Um, and that's pretty much it. So you don't, under, you don't need to understand the underlying mathematics necessarily of the inference framework in order to implement an unbiased estimator, for example. And I hope I can convince you of that today by showing a few examples. So today we will talk very much about this link here between geography and statistics and how we can use some of these statistical approaches together with the stuff that we make um, by analyzing satellite data. 
and how we can use these two sources together to, to um, uh, further our knowledge about uh, land use change, land cover change, and carbon emissions. And why do we need to do that? Why is this so important? I think the easiest way to explain why it is important is to go back to the underlying um, the um, IPCC good practice guidelines. Um, Jim Penman wrote this in, together with a lot of our people. He was the lead author of this back in 2003. And he wrote up the, the, the good practice guidelines for greenhouse gas inventories by the IPCC. And I'll talk a little bit about the so-called methods and guidance document of the GFY. We're currently in the process of releasing the second version of that. And Jim is the lead author of that too, together with myself and, and Curtis Woodcock, John Rayson, and Carly Green and a whole bunch of other authors. We are the five lead authors. So I've been working closely with, with Jim the last couple of years of doing this. So I know Jim is a very, very smart man. And we should all listen to what he said. So in the good practice guidelines, he, he states these two very important criteria for application to greenhouse gas inventories. The first one being that The greenhouse gas emissions to neither over nor underestimate as far as can be judged. Okay. And the second one is that uncertainties are reduced as far as possible. Right. So what does this actually mean? Well, the first criterion here refers very much to the concept of bias. Right. Neither over nor underestimate. This means that it should be unbiased. And bias is the property of something we call an estimator, which is simply a statistical formula. It's just an equation. Some of them are very, very simple. It can be a very simple formula that when applied to a sample or to sample data gives you an estimate. Right? And if the estimator is unbiased, the estimate that you get is unbiased. And unbiased estimate means that, and I'm going to quote, I'm going to pull out my old statistics book here, Mathematical Statistics and Data Analysis. This is one of my textbooks from, from university. And there is a very good definition, I think, of what an unbiased estimate is. He writes, the, the author is John A. Rice. He writes, we say that an estimate is unbiased if it's expectation, ex <coughs> if it's expectation, sorry, equals the quantity we wish to estimate. That is, the estimate is correct on average, end quote. So an estimate is unbiased if its expected value equals the quantity we wish to estimate. So if the quantity we wish to, wish to estimate is the area of deforestation, for example, we say that an estimate is unbiased if the expected value equals to correct the true area of deforestation. Right? That is what it means we have an unbiased estimate. The second criterion refers to uncertainties. And uncertainties are reduced as far as possible. In order to reduce the uncertainty, we need to characterize it. Right? So even though an estimate is unbiased, they will still have some variance. Right? We are selecting a sample, sometimes a very small sample, from a very large population. There is inherent noise in this process, and so on and so forth. So we'll get, there will be some form of variance, which means that the estimate will deviate from the true value. And we can express how much is deviating from the true value with a confidence interval. So we use the confidence interval to express the uncertainty of estimate. And again, I'm going to go back to my textbook here and read out loud what he, how he defines confidence intervals. I also think it's a pretty good definition. He writes that a 95% confidence interval is a random variable that contains the population parameter, which might be area of forest, area of deforestation, with a probability of 0.95.
if we were to take many random samples and form a CI for each one, about 95% of these intervals would contain the, the, the population parameters. So this is what we want. In order for something to be IPCC compliant, we need an unbiased estimate plus minus a confidence interval. Okay. And in order to do that, we have to resort to something called statistical inference. We have to construct these estimators based on sample data. So statistical inference is simply a way to obtain information about a large population by examining a sample. Right? The population is too large for us to examine, examine each element of the, of the population. So we select a subset from that population. And then we examine and analyze that sample and we can obtain information on, on the whole population even though we're examining just a small subset of it. And I'm going to go through here a very, very simple example of inference that I think you're all very familiar with um, that we encounter in, in daily life here. For example, if we have two presidential candidates prior to a presidential election, we typically want to know who is ahead in the polls, who, is, who can we expect to get the most votes. So in this particular example, we have two presidential candidates in the U.S. presidential election 2008. And you know, the American electorate is very large, it's like 150 million people or so. So we can't obviously ask each one who they're going to vote for. That would be a complete census, and we only do that once every four years. So we can't do that. It would be a massive, massive task. And a, and a newspaper, for example, that wants to report on this, they can't do such such a... Um, they, they wouldn't be able to do that. So instead what they do is that they're trying to infer information about the whole U.S. population by examining just a very small subset of that population. So in this particular case, we can see that. And one, one, one in this particular example, we'll see how this is being done. So for example, we have the whole U.S. population now. What we can do is to select a simple random sample of about 500 voters. So I said we have 130 or 150 million voters, or eligible voters at least. We can select a simple random sample of just 500 people, 500 voters, and we'll ask each one of them who are they going to vote for. We'll have our sample data then of 500 answers according to these 500 voters. That's our sample data. We can apply a simple random sample estimator to that sample data to get an unbiased estimate of the number of votes for uh, presidential candidate Obama, for example. And in this case, the simple random sample estimator is, is very simple. Right? It's just the mean value. So we would ask, we have each of the 500 people here. We would ask the first one, you know, who are you going to vote for? I'm going to vote for Obama. Okay, so that's a one. We ask the second person in our sample, yes, I will also vote for Obama. That's a one. The third person says, no, I'm not going to vote for Obama. So that's a zero. And then we sum up. We get a sum of all of these different answers. We divide by the total sample size, 500, and we get an unbiased estimate here of the people that will vote for Obama. In this case, it's 51%. That is our unbiased estimate. And it's pretty easy, actually, to show mathematically that this estimator is unbiased, that its expected value will give us the true parameter mean here, uh, the true population mean. Um, and you can, you can easily do that yourself. I don't, I'm not going to do that here. I think it's a little bit out of the scope of this talk. But just to, just to convince you that this is really is an unbiased estimator. Now this is a small sample. It certainly got some, um, the estimate here is associated with a certain level of variance and we can easily calculate that. And we do that by first calculating a variance 
We have the variance estimator here. It's fairly simple to calculate this too. There we have n, that is 500. Here we have i, yi, which are the different answers. It's just 1, 1, 0, 1, 1, so on and so forth. And then we have the estimate here, which is 0.51. Right? So we can very easily calculate that. We get a variance. We can take the square root of the variance to get the standard error. We multiply with a C-score that corresponds to this 95% confidence level, and we get a confidence interval. I should have put in like a plus minus sign here, but I didn't do that. Right? So here is our confidence interval. So now we have an unbiased estimate of the number of votes for Obama, plus minus a confidence interval. Okay. Now, to make this a little bit more interesting, we know that the electorate is very diverse. We have people of different ethnicity, we have people of different uh, cultural background, living in different parts of the country, different educational backgrounds, different jobs, so on and so forth. And we know that these different groups, these different ethnic and socioeconomic groups and geographical groups too, vote very differently. For example, we know that the black part of the electorate um, votes primarily for Obama. In 2008, there was we could expect that 95% of black voters would vote for Obama, compared to only 43% of white, white voters. Now, if we select a relatively small, this is just an example here, we select a small, simple, random sample of just 100 voters, which is a very small sample, but just to illustrate the point here. And it turns out that we get 70 people that identify as white, 30% that identify as black. We would then expect Obama, when we apply this simple random sample estimator, to get 59% of the votes. If we instead ended up with a simple random sample, we have 95 white voters and 5 black voters, we expect Obama to receive considerably less number of votes. Right? So in this particular case, the simple random sample might not properly represent the population. Or if we wanted to represent the population, we need a very, very large sample. A very large sample that is going to take a long time to, um, to, to uh, interpret and analyze. So one thing we can do here is to introduce something called stratification, right? We can try to do something called a stratified random sampling of the population instead of, instead of a simple random sample. So in this particular case, we could, for example, create two strata, one stratum of white voters, one stratum of black voters, and we would sample them individually right? or separately. So we could, for example, select a simple random sample from stratum 1 and then a simple random um, sample from stratum 2. Our estimator would then not be a simple random sample. It would, a simple random estimator would be a stratified estimator. And it would look slightly different. We'd have to take this stratification into account. So this is just an example. Of, of, of statistical inference in real life. And I think this is an example we're all familiar with. And it happens, this is actually, in one way it's a good example because I think it's a situation we're all familiar with. On the other hand, it's actually a very complicated situation. It turns out that these polls are very, very tricky. And actually sometimes more tricky than the kind of geography-based estimation that I will talk about for the rest of this lecture. And there was a very good article today. This is, this is a little bit of a parenthesis, by the way. There was a very good article today in the New York Times called How Polling Can Go Wrong, written by Nate Cohn, uh, published today, June 30, 2016. And the problem with this, with this particular issue, is that we don't really know who's going to vote. We know that we have a certain number of people who are eligible to vote, but we don't know if all of them are going to vote. And we don't know who is going to vote. 
And what he's talking about in this article is that sometimes what they do is that the population that they're sampling are actually the people that voted last year. Um, and that can, can uh, introduce problems because it tends to over-represent elderly people. It tend to over-represent ethnic mi majorities and under-represent young people and ethnic minorities. Um, so if you want to know more about this issue, which is, first of all, very relevant, we, we get reports like this every day in the news. Um, the New York Times has this, uh, I don't want to make any you know, commercial for New York Times, but they have this series of articles about um, the issues of sampling and population and polling and stuff like that that I, that I think are, are worth reading. Anyway, let's move forward here. And I would argue then that the task of doing this, which we just went through, of trying to make some inference about the, the voting population of the U.S. in order to say who is going to win a certain election, is really not that different from trying to estimate the amount of force in a country or the amount of deforestation in a country. It's really the same thing, right? And here we have an example of this. Here we have the country of Cambodia, we have a map showing areas of forest loss, stable forest, and stable non-forest. And we can easily then see that, for example, these different land cover categories, the land cover change categories, the different map classes, if you will, they can correspond to different demographic groups of the population. And our sampling frame or population here are now all the pixel of this country instead of voters. But, but the, the, the statistical issue here is very, very similar. And we could implement the exact same estimators and the exact same equations to get unbiased estimate of the amount of deforestation, for example. So let's go through this exercise. But before we do that, I'd like to introduce some, some terminology. First of all, we have this term accuracy assessment that, 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 that is... Um, I think it's very, I think people are very well aware of this, this term, accuracy assessment, is, is well indented into the community. And the way I like to think about accuracy assessment is, is this whole analysis that we do where we identify classification errors in a map. So we need to design and implement the accuracy assessment. So there are a couple of different steps. Uh, involved in that. The first one is that we need to figure out how to sample the map. Right? So we have our population, which in the example here I'm going to show is the country of Cambodia. That's our population. All the pixels that make up the country of Cambodia. It's millions and millions of pixels. We can't analyze every single one of them, so we're going to have to sample them, just like we did with the American voters in the example. Then for each unit in our sample, we need to collect reference observations. So in the polling example, the reference observation might just simply be asking a voter who he's going to vote for. That's kind of our reference observation. In this case, we can't ask the pixel what it is. We're going to have to take a look in, 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 in various data <clears throat> to see what's really going on at each individual sample unit. So it's the best assessment of the land surface condition, right? So has this pixel gone through, uh, has this pixel experienced deforestation, for example, or is it just stable forest, is it stable non-forest, is it agriculture, so on and so forth. And sometimes we already have a sample of reference observation in place. You know, the best example of that would be a national forest inventory. We have the population, which is a country, and we have typically a systematic sample across the country where skilled foresters are visiting each unit in this, in this sample, and they are collecting then reference observation of what is going on there. They actually go onto the ground and doing that, so that's a, that's a sample of reference observations of very, very high quality. Sometimes, and this is the case in Cambodia, we don't have any such sample. So we're going to have to collect it. And, and in order to collect that, we need to identify reference data. So that's the data we use to collect these observations. So for example, if you have a time series of Landsat observations and you're 
serving these, these sample units in time series of Landsat data, then Landsat data is your reference data. Okay. Which means that for each unit in our sample, for each location in our sample, we then have a reference label according to the reference data. And we have a map label. And we can compare these two to say something about how accurate the map is. Meaning, to which degree does the map correspond to reference conditions? The measures of accuracy will express the degree to which the map corresponds, corresponds to, to reference conditions. And usually of higher importance are these area estimators that we can construct from the sample of reference observations. So to break it down, there are like three steps involved here. The first one being the sampling design, where we decide which elements of the map to visit. Right? Where we will collect these, op uh, these, these reference observations. Where, we will co where, where will we collect the reference observation? And we can do this with a simple random sample, we can do it with a systematic sample, we can do it with a stratified random or stratified systematic sample. There are other more elaborate sample designs like cluster sample and two-stage sampling and stuff like that. Once we have done that, we need to then determine the land surface reference condition at, at the locations of the sample unit. Right, so now we have our sample in place the next step then is to identify a set of reference data and determine the reference condition at each of these locations. And this is usually a very time consuming exercise. Right? If you have, let's say, 500 units spread across a country, you're going to have to collect the data for these 500 units. And, <coughs> sorry. and you're going to have to then determine what the reference conditions are. Once you have done that, you can analyze it. So the last part of this, this whole workflow is the analysis. And this is where we then construct our estimators. We, uh, we calculate our accuracy measures and our confidence interval and all that. So yeah, and before we actually go through the example, another central part of this is the error matrix. If you've ever written, if you ever read a paper, uh, a change detection paper, for example, where they do an accuracy assessment, you will typically encounter these error matrix, error matrices. <clears throat> so here we have an error matrix expressed in the form of sample counts. Right. So let's take a look at this because this is important being able to, to, to understand an error matrix. We have map here, so we have the map labels being represented by the rows. Right? The map labels being represented by the rows. In this case we only have, we have a very, very simple map. It's only two classes. It's forest loss and then everything else. Everything else being lumped into one class here. Right? So the map labels are represented by the rows here. And then we have the reference observations which are being represented by the columns here. And then we have our total sample size down here. So let's say that this was a sample of 500 units. The first entry here in the error matrix would tell us how many of these 500 units were correctly classified as forest loss. And then we have this one here, element 2-2 of the error matrix. This will tell us how many of these units were correctly classified no loss or everything else. Right? This would typically be a very, very high number in this particular case. Of importance here are errors of omission and errors of commission. If we look at the errors of omission of forest loss, they're down here, N2-1. So these are the sample units that were mapped as no loss, but up on examination in our reference data, it turns out that these were actually forest loss. Right? So we omitted the forest loss in this particular case. 
We mapped it as being stable land cover, but in reality, it was forest loss, right? The map omitted the forest loss in this particular case. That's why we call it errors of omission of forest loss. And then we have the errors of commission, N1, 2 here. So these were things that were, so these sample units were mapped as forest loss, but the reference data says that it's no loss. So the reference observations are no loss, but the map label here is forest loss. So in this case, we committed forest loss. Right? This is indicative of an overrepresentation of the forest loss. So these are pixels that will show up as deforestation, as red, for example, in our map, but in reality, they're not deforestation at all. Right? Errors of commission. So we have, here we then have the total number of sample units in, in, in these two map classes, and here we have the total number of sample units in the reference classes, right? So these numbers will, will be different if we have errors in our map, which we typically do. And if this is a stratified sample, we have the strata weights out here, and these are very important if the sample is stratified. And the strata weights, really what they are is the area proportion of these two strata, right? So in this case, the forest loss might be very small. It might be like 2%, and this here would be then 98%. So it was 0 0.02 and then 0.98 and sums to 1 or 100%. Now, if this is a stratified sample, we can't really do much with these sample counts because we then have a disproportionate number of sample units per strata. This is only 2%, but it might be, if this is only 2%, it might be that the total number of sample units, like we get 20% of the sample units in this, in, in, in this stratum here, for example. So we can't really use this to calculate accuracy measures. What we're going to have to do instead, and what we want to do, is to express this as area proportions. So rather than saying that, oh, I have five errors of commission, what does that mean? You have five errors of commission. It doesn't really mean anything. Or I have two errors of omission. It's not terribly informative. It doesn't say much. So what we want to do is to express this as area proportion. So I want to say that 2% or 1% or whatever it might be of the total map area were committed forest loss, right? So the, the commission error of forest loss represent 1% or 2% or whatever it might be of the total map area. And same with the other elements here in, our, in my error matrix. I want to be able to express this as uh, area proportion. And if this is a stratified sample, a stratified random sample, we can then rather easily calculate these area proportion. We have the strata weights, and then we just take the sample counts in each element here and divide by the total number of sample units per strata. And then we get a new error matrix where the elements here are expressed as area proportions. So this would now be you know, 1% and this would be 99% or 1% 1, 1 and this might be 89% and this might be another couple of percents here. And this is now much more informative. So if we sum across the columns here, so we have the row totals out here, these would now correspond to the actual strata weight. This will be the proportion of the area occupied by this map class here. Right? So these are not really estimates. That's why there are no hats on these, right? You see we got a little hat on these, meaning that they're estimated area proportions. These are not really estimates. This is the total area of these two strata. And then we have these here. These are the column totals. And these are important because this would then be the area of forest loss and no loss according to the reference data. And this turns out to actually be an unbiased estimate of the area of forest loss. And we'll get to that in a little bit. 
What we can do now also when we have this expressed as area proportion is to very easily calculate accuracy measure. We can calculate the overall accuracy is just the diagonal total, which is just simply the, the area that was correctly classified. Right. We take the diagonal total, so we, you know, it's one minus the, the error of omission and commission. So the area proportion that was correctly classified, right? which in this particular case, if we have a if we have a map of forest lost and then everything else, most likely the overall accuracy would be very very high, because this will really be a measure of how well we map no forest loss, and we ought to be pretty good at that. In this case. more interest interesting accuracy measures might be class specific accuracy measures we had the user's accuracy the user's accuracy of forest loss would be this guy here divided by the map proportion right so this is 1 minus the commission error 1 minus the commission error And then we have the producer's accuracy, which would be this guy divided by the area proportion according to the reference data. So this would be 1 minus the omission error. Right? This is the complements of omission and commission errors, uses and producer's accuracy. And in this particular case, if we have a map of force loss and everything else, these two will be it's fine. Um, so we were just here. This is like a cliffhanger. Right? We, we, um, we're just going to introduce the area estimators, which is like at the heart of everything here. So it's worth waiting for. <laughs> so in the methods and guidance document, and you know, I mentioned this many times now, and, and, and the methods and guidance, the second version is about to be published this week or next week, actually. And we have quite a lot of material on the kind of stuff that I'm talking about here today. And, and I'm only talking about one estimation approach, stratified estimation. There's a couple of different ones. And we try to provide guidance in the methods and guidance document on when to use which estimate. And we can with this error matrix we can very easily construct two different kinds of estimators that will give us an unbiased estimate of the area of forest loss. One is called a bias adjusted estimator and the neat thing here is that it actually has an expression of the bias. Right. So here we then have you know, this is very, very intuitive, and this is why I like to show this. The bias adjusted estimator, we have the map proportion out here. Right? So here we have the area of forest loss out here, expressed as a percentage of the total map area. We have to multiply by the total area in hectares in order to, in order to, um, to express this as a hectare. But it's basically an area in, in hectares. But right now we're, we're looking at this as a proportion of the total area. Right. So this is the proportion of forest loss, and then we add the area of omitted forest loss. Right. So here we have, sorry, I forgot to show the error. So out here we then have the map proportion of forest loss. Right. This is what we know is biased. Right. We can't believe the map because we have errors in the map. So the map is not unbiased. But what we do is that we take this biased map proportion and then we add the error of omission. So the amount of forest loss that our map omitted, we include in our estimate. And then we exclude the error of commission. Right? 
So here down here we have the area of forest loss. And then here in parentheses we have the bias. And the bias is the omission minus the commission. And the answer here is the area of forest loss according to the reference data. Another way to think about this is with a stratified estimator. In this case, we're not necessarily making use of the map here. We're just summing the reference observations, the area of forest loss according to the reference data. So the sum of reference observations, which in this case would be this guy plus this guy. And it would give us the exact same answer as the bias adjusted estimator in this case. So it's two different ways of thinking about it. And I won't go into detail about the difference between these estimators, but um, in the methods and guidance documents, as I said, we're trying to outline guidance for this. And, and, and I think what one can say, though, is that if we have continuous map classes, so we have a map where each pixel has like a percentage of the afforestation, the bias-adjusted estimator will give you a slightly smaller uh, standard error or confidence interval. Whereas if your map classes are categorical, meaning that each pixel belongs to exactly one of five or six or whatever map classes, right, each pixel has exactly one map label, then a stratified estimator is, is, uh, is preferable. So I think we have all the tools now that we need to go through an actual example here. And the example I'm going to show is, is from the country of Cambodia. I would also like to mention before I do that, that the, um, a lot of the information that I will be talking about are in these two papers here. Everything is in these two papers. And stratified estimation is explained in William Cochran's book, which has been around for many, many decades now. The third edition is from 1977. That's the one I'm using. Um, written by William Co Cochran at Harvard University across the river here from where I'm sitting. And these two papers, really what they are, are um, illustrations of how to implement these sampling techniques in a geography context. That's really all there is to it. Um, it's not like I invented any of this. I'm just kind of showing how to how to uh, construct these estimators and to calculate confidence interval in a geography context. So let's go through that exercise. And and um, as I said, the, the, the example here will be from the country of Cambodia. So the objective is to estimate the area of forest loss in the country of Cambodia from 2000 to 2011. And all I have at my disposal is this map here. That's all I have. I have nothing else. And this is the map that I got from um, Matt Hansen's Global Forest Cover Change data set. So as you're probably aware of, in 2013, he published global data on forest cover change, annual forest cover change from 2000 to 2011. So what I did is that I extracted those data layers from uh, uh, for the country of Cambodia, and I created this map here. Very, very easy. Right. And it has six different classes, mainly forest and not forest. That's the majority of the area. We have some water, and then we have forest loss, showing here in red. And then we have a little, little bit of forest gain, and then there is even less of something called loss and gain. So areas that experience both forest loss and forest gain over this time period. So this is the situation, right? Um, I have my map and I have nothing else. So what I need to do now is to, and when I have my map and what I want to do is to estimate the area of forest loss. I know that I can't just simply count the red pixels here because that's a biased number. I will get a biased value of the area of forest loss. So what I'm going to have to do is to select a sample from this population here, from this map, 
and then I'm going to have to collect reference observations for each sample unit, and then I have to analyze that sample and construct an unbiased estimator of area. And then I calculate a confidence interval. So that's what I'm going to do. <clears throat> um, and as I said before, this is very important. I can't just simply count the red pixels. We have a red pixel here, for example. We don't know if that's actually Forrest Loss. We know that the map says it is, but we don't know if it's Forrest Loss in reality. We do not know that. So therefore, we can't just count the pixels on the map. However, I can see that even though there's quite a lot of deforestation, it's still a relatively small part of the population here, maybe 5% of the total area. So the map becomes very valuable to me because it shows me where the deforestation is. So it allows me to sample it. I can use this information as a stratification of my sample, and that's very, very valuable. If I didn't have this map, it would be much more difficult. I could do like a simple random sample, but I would need a, I would need a very, very large sample. So, just one slide here from the Methods and Guidance document. This is from the second version of the Methods and Guidance document. And what we're trying to do now is to focus much less on how to make maps. I mean, you don't even have to make a map these days. You can just download data and, and, and play around in a GIS and, and get a map for your country that way. Right? So making maps is becoming easier and you can do it in so many, many different ways that we're not really providing much information of how to make maps. Instead, we're trying to focus on how can you use the map once you have one. And here we have a decision tree from the Methods and Guidance document. The first question here, do you plan to use a map for estimating activity data? Uh, you don't have to. As I said before, you could do a simple random sample or a systematic sample of the whole country. Um, that's fine. You don't necessarily need one. It's usually a very good idea, though, okay? especially if, if what you're interested in is just a very small part of the population, then a map will, will become very important. So in my case, yes, I plan to use a map for estimating activity data. And again, activity data um, is the IPCC lingo for areas of land use change or land cover change. Right? And, and the, typically what we're interested in are changes in, in, in forest land, right? changes in forest area. So in my case, I would, ask, I would answer yes to that question. The second question, do you plan to use a change map, meaning do you plan to use a map that shows areas of change? You don't have to, but again, in my case, I have one. And if you have one, it's a good idea to use it. So yes. I plan to use a change map because my map actually shows areas of deforestation and forest gain. And then do you have a reference sample in place? No, I don't. So I end up here in box number five. I answer yes, yes, and no. So what I'm going to have to do is to select the sampling design and then select the stat statistical estimators for that sampling design. So this is the route that I'm going. And in the methods and guidance document, we then provide information for each of these decision points here to guide the users through the different decisions here. So what I'm going to illustrate now is this particular route here, shown by the red lines with the red, red arrows. So this is the situation. I have my objective stated, estimating the area of forest loss. I have a categorical change map. So each pixel in my map belongs to one and only one of six distinct classes. There's five here, but it's actually six. And I don't have any reference sample in place. I don't have the resource to go visit anything in the field. I'm going to have to resort to whatever free data I can get my hands on. And in this case, it will be Landsat data and Google Earth data. Therefore, my preferred sampling design is stratified random. And that is because I'm interested in the area of forest loss, and it's a relatively small proportion of the area. And I have a change map that shows me roughly where it is. So stratifying accordingly is a good idea. So therefore, following the guidelines in the Medicine Guidance document, 
I'm going to implement a stratified random sample. I'm going to select a stratified random sample. My preferred area estimator is a stratified estimator, not a bias adjusted estimator, and that is because my change map is categorical. People like uh, Steve Stamen and at, at uh, State University of New York, Ron McRoberts at the US Forest Service, they've done a good job showing um, the efficiency of these different estimators in various situations. Their research have concluded that the stratified estimator is better when I have a categorical change map. If I had a continuous change map, I would probably be better off doing a bias adjusted <coughs> estimator. All right, so that's the situation. So what I'm going to have to do now is to first to select my stratified random sample. And part of this sampling design is to determine the sample size and allocation to strata. Um, I have, and then I'm going to have to examine each of my, my um, sample units in my reference data. My reference data is Landsat. And the beauty of Landsat, there's a lot of beauties of Landsat, but one of the beauties is that the data is completely free. We have an archive of historical Landsat data that is completely free of charge. So there's really no reason to not examine a time series of Landsat observations. I have the time series, so why not use it? So that will give me a better reference data set than just using some individual snapshots in time. So I'm going to look at time series of Landsat data for each unit in my sample. And I, I'll also take a look in Google Earth and see if there's anything helpful in Google Earth. And then finally, once I have done that, I've collected all my reference observations, I'll do my analysis. So I'll construct my estimators of area, confidence intervals, and calculate accuracy measures. So the first step is to estimate the sample size. And I'm not sure how much, I mean, I think we're running a little bit short on time here. So I think I'll just brush this over pretty quickly. There's a lot of papers out there that explain how to use this. And it's just to kind of give you a ballpark estimate. But at the heart of it is that I have here a target standard error that I want to achieve. And this variable here, p hat, that's the area of the parameter that I want to estimate. In this case, area of force loss. So I'm going to have to try to specify a target standard error of the area of force loss that I want to achieve. That's really what is driving this whole um, <clears throat> estimation of sample size. So this is what it might look like. SI here, you know, it's explained in my good practice paper, so you might want to take a look exactly what this is. It's, it's all just guesswork. We don't really know any of this beforehand. So we're just guessing. What we do know are, is WI. We know that. That's just the strata weights. We know that from the map. And then we have this SI parameter that I'm not going to talk about. You can read about it. <clears throat> but the most important variable in this, in this equation is this down here. So in this particular case, the area of force loss, according to the map, is 6.5%. I'm going to set my target standard error to 1%, meaning a confidence interval about 2% of the total area. So that's what I'm going to try to achieve. If I do that, I get a total sample size of 540. And I noticed that it doesn't say that here, but I, I, I looked at these slides this morning and I realized I forgot to put that in there. But trust me, it's 540 um, um, pixels. That's my total sample size here. And then I'm going to have to allocate this to strata. And there's a couple of different ways of doing this. And you can do this more or less complicated. Uh, the literature talks about these optimal allocation approaches. You can implement the Nyman allocator and stuff like this. And Steve Stamen has a good paper discussing that. In the good practice document that I wrote up with, with Steve and others in 2014, we try to do this pretty simplistically. So we're saying that we should try to aim for something close to proportional because that favors estimation of area. And then we just bump up the small classes so we get at least 50 units in the strata. So this is, here we have, so here we have the allocations down here. Our proportional allocation would look like this. 
221, 266, 14, 35, 2, and 1. Now we can't live with 14, 2, and 1 sample units. That's not enough. So what we do instead is we bump this up to 50, 75, and 50, and then we split the difference proportionally between these two larger classes. It'll end up then with 550 in total. Right. So this is our this is our allocation of the sample. Now, the other thing I see here is that we have these two classes, five and six. Right? They are very, very small. 0.23 and 0.36% of the total area here. So what I'm going to do is to lump these together. I'm going to merge these two strata number five and six into one single fourth gain stratum. Right? And I'm going to put 50 units in its total. So the area here of this stratum is going to go up a little bit. It's still just about 100,000 hectares, which is a very, very small area. So then I just simply do that. I select my stratified sample and I end up with a sample here. Um, this is what it looks like. Nothing, not too much about it. <clears throat> so this would be the equivalent of these 500 voters. So instead of identifying 500 voters, I have now identified 500 pixels or 550 pixels of the country of Cambodia. Right? It's exactly the same thing. This is my sample that is representing the population. So I see here that people are asking a little bit about these papers. I actually think that if you go to Google Scholar and just type in the name of those papers, they will, there will be PDF links. I don't know who provided those links. It wasn't me, but somebody did. Um, anyway, so I have my sample. Now I'm going to have to um, examine the sample. and. What I'm going to do, as I said before, is that I'm going to use time series of Landsat data. So I go back here to the, the Bioda tools. This is the interface of QJS, which is, is built into the uh, Bioda virtual machine. And then we have developed uh, something called TS Tools, which is a plugin to QJS that allows you to display time series of, of whatever data you want, but, but typically Landsat data. So in this particular case, I see here I have a time series of Landsat observations. You can't really see this. It's a red little pixel here. Don't worry about this parallelogram here. Just focus on the red pixel here. So in this interface, I click that, and I can see a time series of surface reflectance here. And this is band 5. I can, if I go here, I can switch to bands, right? Selecting reference observation. Uh, Warren Cohen at the U.S. Forest Service and also at uh, Oregon State University has developed a, a tool called uh, TimeSync, which allows you to do something similar that is also very, very helpful. The good thing about TimeSync is that you can, here you actually have to download the Landsat data. In TimeSync, you don't have to do that. It's actually reading it from, from a Google server. But anyway, this is, this, is, um, this is a very powerful tool. In this case, it's obvious that this is stable forest, at least from 2001 to 2005. I see this pixel here. And what is pretty cool here, too, is if I click one of these points in the time series, it will display the actual Landsat image here. Um, so you can really figure out what is going on. You see here, this is a very stable um, Forest. This is this is shortwave infrared reflectance. If there was a disturbance, you would see this band five reflectance just spike up here, and we're not seeing this, right? So this is stable forest. So I put a stable forest label on it, and I move forward. I do that for my 550 units. I end up with an error matrix. Right? 
Okay, these are the sample counts, and as I said, the sample counts are pretty fun to look at. I can see here exactly how many that was correctly classified, but it's not terribly helpful. I want to express this in area proportions. So I do that. Right? Can't compute by sample count. A sample is stratified. Need to estimate area proportion. I should also mention that I just made these numbers up. So um, if you're Cambodia, if you're from Cambodia and you're working for the government on, on reporting, don't don't use this. <laughs> use the methodology, but don't use the don't use the numbers here because this I just I just made it up for the for an example. Um, all right, so I'm going to have to convert this to area proportions, and it's very simple. For each of the elements in my area matrix, I have my area proportion according to the map, my strata weight. I multiply by the first element, and I divide by the total number of pixels in that stratum. Right? So in this case, 165 divided by 175 times 41%. So I do that for each element here. And I now have an error matrix expressed as area proportions. And as I said before, um, oh yeah, I see uh, Cynthia is linking to uh, Warren's paper there. That's, 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 a, that's a very good tool. And I think that is close. If it's not operational already, it should be very soon. And I've used that tool for this, this particular exercises, and it's, it's very good. Um, so I have my error, my, have my error matrix expressed as an area proportion here. Stratified area estimator of area. That sounds weird. Stratified estimator of area, or just a stratified estimator according to Cochrane. Um, Cochrane doesn't talk about areas or geography or IPCC or anything. IPCC didn't exist when he wrote that book in the 50s. Um, so it has nothing to do with area. And as I said, be, be, um, as I said, those papers in RSE that I wrote is really just trying to take the methods in Cochrane and apply it to a geography scenario. Um, but this is what the area, this is what a stratified estimator would, would, would look like in this particular case here. And really what it is is this guy plus this guy plus this guy plus this guy plus that. And you end up with the column total here. This here is the stratified est estimate of the area of forest loss. This here is your unbiased estimate of forest loss. And this is your unbiased estimate of forest gain. You have to multiply this by 18,200,000 hectares in order to express it in hectares. Um, and I can do that here. And I can also calculate a standard error. I know this equation here looks a bit messy, but it's really not. All the information that goes in it are, are, um, is in this error matrix. So this gives me a standard error. I multiply by 1.96, and I get a confidence interval. So down here now, I have my stratified estimators expressed in hectares. I have my confidence interval expressed as hectare, in hectares too. Right. So forest loss, I see here I have an unbiased area estimate of 1,137,000 hectares plus minus 150,000 hectares. Right. And I can calculate, for example, margin of error, worst, margin of error, sampling error, and things like that. I don't think there is a universal definition of ex Exactly that is. Uh, but I like to think of margin of error as the confidence interval divided by the area estimate. And if that is above 100%, meaning the, the confidence interval is larger than the actual area estimate, meaning that it includes zero, um, you can't really say much about it. You can't really say that that area is significantly different from zero, but in this case, that's not the case. So I have area estimates for each of my um, my map classes here, and I know I, I kind of did this a little bit quickly here because I'm I'm, I'm uh, running out of time here. But really, all it is is that I have my error matrix, right? 
This is a cross tabulation. Again, I have my map classes in rows. I have my reference observations as columns. So I just simply cross tabulate that. In Biota, we have tools that allows you to create this error matrix very, very quickly. I just simply calculate the area proportions. Okay, very easy calculation. I get my error matrix here as estimate the area proportion, and the area estimators just falls right out of it. Okay. The area estimators are just the, the stratified area estimators are the column totals here. The confidence interval uh, is also very easy to calculate. We have scripts that, that do these calculations for you. You can very easily do it in the in LibreOffice or, or Excel if you prefer to use that. <clears throat> it's a rather simple calculation. And all of this then it gets expressed as a proportion of area multiplied by the total map area to express this in hectares here. Right. Um, and I, I, just, I know we're going to do questions later, but there is a question here. Can you, can you explain what a confidence interval is? And, and I have to go back to so the, so the mathematical definition of it, according to my, one of my favorite textbooks here, I'll read that again. It says that a 95% confidence interval contains the population parameter of interest, which in this case is, um, here it's not forest, right? Contains the population parameter, the area of, of deforestation, for example, with a probability of 0.95. Meaning that if we were to take many random samples like we just did, we did one now, right? We took one random sample. If we did it many, many times and we calculated a confidence interval for each one of them, about 95% of those intervals would contain the population parameter would contain a true area of forest loss. Right. So it's, it's a way to express the uncertainty in these area estimates here. Right. So in this particular case, the area estimate is 1,137,000. The confidence interval is actually very narrow. It's plus minus 150,000 hectares. If this was like 2 million hectares, then you know it would be very hard to say anything about this estimate here. We couldn't really separate this from zero. We wouldn't be able to say that this is significantly different from zero, right? Um, so this is, you know, the more narrow the confidence interval is, the more precise this estimate is here. Right. So we can, if you look here, for example, we have a very large confidence interval for the area of forest gain. So we have much, much more uncertainty in the area of forest gain than what we have in the area of forest loss. And the confidence interval, again, is just we calculate the variance. We take the square root of the variance, and we multiply by 2. That's, pretty, that's all there is to it. And then finally, we can then very easily calculate the accuracies here too. And as you can see, the accuracy of the forest gain class is considerably lower, right? As indicated by the larger uncertainty in that estimate too. You see, we have relatively high accuracy. And again, it might be that the forest loss in Cambodia is, according to this map, is much less accurate than this. It might be even more accurate. I do not know. <laughs> Uh, as I said, I, I have to emphasize, I just made these numbers up just for the point of illustration. But the important point here is that you can't calculate these accuracy measures based on the sample counts. We have to use the error proportions. In this particular case, the uses accuracy we actually could, uh, but, but never mind. Always base your accuracy calculations on the esti estimated area proportions and not on the sample counts. So then we have our final analysis. So now we've done what we set out to do. We have estimates here 
These estimates are unbiased. They have an uncertainty that is quantified, meaning that we have now fulfilled these two um, criteria set out by the IPCC. Okay. This would be IPCC compliant reporting of activity data in Cambodia, for example. So just to wrap up, a few conclusions here. This is very important. All maps have errors, right? Even the map I used have errors. Map is great at making maps, but he's not that great, right? All maps have errors, even if Matt Hansen did it. Right? All maps have errors. Doesn't matter if you use very fancy new time series tools, stuff like that. You can always rest assured that your map is not perfect. Therefore, you can't not you can't just simply count the pixels in your map. You can't count the area mapped to deforestation and use that okay? because it will deviate from the true area of deforestation okay? or whatever it is. It will be biased. So what you're going to have to do instead is to construct an unbiased area estimator to remove that bias, to remove the bias introduced by classification errors. The maps become very important, though, because, because, because this activity data we're trying to estimate is typically a very, very small part of the population. And it's much harder to estimate something that is a small part of the population. The same thing if you want to estimate how many people in a certain country carry a very, very rare disease. Right? It's going to be much harder than estimating how many people that have diabetes, for example. Right, which is a much more common disease. So the map serves a very important purpose here. It will help us identify where the activities are occurring. So yes, the unbiased estimation is a necessity because the map have errors. So the, the air area you get from just counting pixels in the map will be biased because of classification error. The unbiased estimators um, removes that bias. That's why they're called unbiased. Right? And the other point to be made here is that this is fairly easy to do. So, one question here is there a max error that IPCC can accept? Uh, no, the IPCC doesn't doesn't say anything about that, and neither does the does the MGD. And sometimes people ask me, like, what's the maximal maximum allowable accuracy measure accuracy you can you can you can live with? And I can never I I, I will never be able to answer such a question. Um, so first of all, I think that it, it's it's very difficult to set any thresholds and at the end of the day it will be a discussion between the donor country and the country in charge of the greenhouse gas reporting. Right? So for example Colombia and Germany uh, or Brazil and Norway or, or, or whatever or however it works when they negotiate these things they are going to have to um, gonna, they are going to have to discuss these maximal allowable errors. Uh, and, and people like me and others, we can show how you estimate the errors and you estimate the bias and all that, but then how to make use of that information for salt-based payments, that's something that, um, that, that's something that, um, that's something that is between uh, the country and, and the donor country. A few more questions there. How many samples should we get in each class? So if you look at the good practices document that I wrote in 2014 in RSC, um, we do outline some very simple recommendations for how to allocate a sample to strata. And it will depend on your, on your, um, on your objective. So if the objective is to estimate area, then we would recommend something close to what I showed something close to proportional, but then put at least 50 units in the, um, in the smaller classes. Um, 
And there is another question here is good. Would it be possible to have step-by-step -step procedure on how to analyze the error matrix from calculating the omission, commission accuracy standard errors, unbiased error, blah, blah, blah? Yes, we actually have that. Um, and this is, this is, um, let me very quickly pull up the uh, GitHub. So a lot of the things that we do, we um, we put everything on GitHub. So here is a, the Biota GitHub site. Um, one of the grad students um, that that we work with here is Christopher Holden. He puts a lot, a lot of stuff on GitHub um, that is very helpful. Um, Eric Bullock. Another grad student um, also put a lot of stuff there. So I think if you look at the GitHub, uh, the Biota GitHub repositories, there are PDFs that that shows the step by step, like really which buttons to push and stuff like that. <clears throat> um, so a few more questions here. So does the Kappa metric is no longer recommended for quality assessment of land change maps? So I, I I wouldn't, you know, I've never really seen the benefit of using Kappa. You, I mean, in, at the end of the day, it's like overall accuracy adjusted for chance or random agreement, and I, I don't I don't see why that would be helpful. Um, uh, there is a good paper by um, uh, Gil Pontius at Clark University, which I think, I think it's called Death to Kappa. Um, and and he, he talks in length about uh, why one shouldn't use Kappa. And in the, good pra in, in, the, in the RC paper that I wrote that I talked about before, we also have a, some explanations of that. I would recommend for accuracy measures, the three accuracy measures that I talked about, but then of importance is 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 usually um, um, yeah, I think somebody is uh, linking to that now. The Gil Pontius, his last name is almost the same as my first name, but we're not related. <laughs> Okay, um, great. So thanks again, Pontus. I think we're going to go ahead and stop there. We've gone over a little, a little bit of the time, but I think um, we had some really great questions. So we thank you again for joining us today and giving a really uh, fantastic presentation. So we will make note of some of these, and if there's any we didn't get to um, that are relevant, we're going to try to create a document that we will post on the website at a later date that has some of these questions and answers to them. So. Um, thanks again, everyone, for joining us, and um, we hope to see you here online for our final webinar um, next week. Thank you.